Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The verse for our consideration this morning is a single verse that was read to you a couple of minutes ago. Once again, we're in Jeremiah chapter 31, where we read, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. Here ends our reading. My brothers and sisters in Christ, all 36,899 McDonald's started as one store. All 27,339 Starbucks started as one store. All 44,608 Subways started, you guessed it, as one store. With this in mind, why don't we brainstorm a bit and see if we can come up with the next can't-miss restaurant. I would think that if you go back and think of a a subway, that it went from one to thousands, we also should be able to come up with something. I think ethnic food is is a pretty good choice. But here's the problem. There's lots of ethnic food that you can get. If you drive through Green Bay, you can see Italian food and Mexican food and Chinese food and and Vietnamese food. Where do we find something that hasn't been done before? Well, how about Scottish food? The Scottish food market seems to be pretty untapped. And what can be more Scottish than haggis? For your information, haggis is a savory pudding containing sheep's pluck, that is heart, liver, and lungs, minced with onion, oatmeal, spices, and salt, encased in the animal's stomach. Ah, the joys of comfort food. (laughs) Quick trip to the bank and then to the local retailer of sheep, heart, liver, and lungs, and we are ready to open our restaurant. The Haggis Emporium, poised for success. Oh, I will tell you what will happen immediately after we open the restaurant, though. We will be at the mercy of all kinds of online reviews. Everything will be rated. The food, the atmosphere, the wait staff, that's a, that's a lot of pressure. And even if you decide to pass on the gold mine, that is the Haggis Emporium, you are never going to escape that rating pressure. If you happen to be a student, you you know all about it. You are constantly being rated through tests and grades and GPAs and ACTs and SAT scores. If you happen to work outside the home, you are constantly being rated. Performance assessment and job reviews. It is a simple fact of life that anything that can be rated will be rated. How you parent, how much you weigh, how you dress, how much you save for your retirement is all part of being rated or graded or critiqued. And that's pretty much the way it's been ever since you were a little kid. If you happen to be somebody who was an overachiever, you were a good student when you were younger, there's a lot of pressure on you to continue to live up to expectations. If you happen to be the kind of person that was average or you really struggled, there was a lot of pressure on you in order to be better at something than somebody else. You see, that's the problem. That's the problem with all of this comparing and competing that goes on in life. 
It is always about being better or worse than somebody else. Being stronger or weaker, smarter or dumber, prettier or uglier. It is all about trying to live up to somebody else's expectations. And you can never really be who you are. Often, we spend so much time trying to meet the expectation of somebody else as a parent, as a friend, as a employee, as an employer, as a boyfriend, as a girlfriend, that it is very easy to lose sight of who we are. And we begin to see life as some sort of performance. Like I'm performing for you, and if I perform well enough, you will like me for who I am. But the problem is there are so many different people that we are performing for, And we don't always understand the critiquing system that it can lead to frustration. Here's the issue. If you're not careful, this can bleed into your spiritual life as well. You begin to think that somehow God is going to bless you according to your performance. And once you have lost one too many battles with temptation, it's easy to begin to think that God is going to express his displeasure in your life. Oh, you have been told about grace. You have been told about grace a lot, I hope. And it seems at times, though, that heaven can be a long way down the road. And that when I fail in my performance with God, that God will forgive me, of course, and God is going to take me to heaven, of course. But what he is going to do is he is going to take out his displeasure on me yet in this world. What can happen with that, and it happens quickly, is that when we don't get the job, or the date, or the thing that we think is going to make us content and happy in this world, we doubt all over again whether or not God really loves us. Every setback, from the transmission on the car going, to the septic tank exploding, to the worrying call from the doctor all serve as kindling for a fire of doubt. You want to know what's wrong with this system? What's wrong with the how do I rate system? It is that little word, I. Maybe it is an egotistical I who is forever looking down on other people who don't seem to be doing quite as well as we're doing. And so we go all hyper-competitive because my entire understanding of myself, all of the joy and contentment that I feel in myself always comes from being smarter than, richer than anybody else. Of course, you have the opposite end of the spectrum as well. And that is the beat down I. This is the I who has never really met expectations. This I no longer believes that it is possible to meet expectations. This sort of person ends up walking through life listless and resentful. That system is broke. The how do... I rate system doesn't work. There must be something else. There is something else. And that's what our text this morning talks about. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. God says that this new covenant 
a covenant of grace eliminates the need that we have to think we have to earn God's love. This new covenant, this covenant of grace, also gets rid of the idea that every time something goes wrong in my life, I am able to interpret this as God being angry with me. St. Paul understood the need for that new covenant when he thought about what he had been and he thought about what he had done, he wrote, I don't even deserve to be called an apostle. Uh, Earlier than that, he calls himself a a stillborn, a, a dead fetus. You know, sin will do that to you. Sin will rob you of your worth and leave you feeling dead. Guilt without forgiveness will lead you to hate yourself. But God revealed the antidote to Paul. 1 Corinthians 15.10 says, By the grace of God, I am what I am. You see what grace does? Grace takes out the I from the equation, how do I rate, and replaces it with Jesus. Jesus replaces the I who feels like a miserable failure. Jesus replaces the I that has to be in competition with everybody and beat everybody at everything in order to feel good about self. And that's the reason why when Jeremiah recorded these words, he records God saying, For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. God is reiterating what God always reiterates. That no matter how things may look on the outside of your life, the one thing that you can be absolutely sure of is that you have God's unconditional love. When God was speaking to Israel and to Judah, they were not looking so hot. They were not rating very highly in the eyes of the rest of the world. When God spoke to these these words to Judah and to Israel, They didn't rate very highly in their own eyes. And yet, it is never about how we rate in somebody else's eyes that matters. You see, it is by the grace of God, you are who you are. You are righteous for Jesus' sake. You are gifted in the ways that God needs you to be gifted, whether that impresses anybody else in this world or not. Grace is the answer to that defeated I, that I that never thinks that you are good enough, because grace tells you who you are in God's sight that he has given you the gifts and the abilities that he needs for his kingdom. Grace is the antidote for that competitive I. Who do you think has given you all of those gifts that the rest of the world values? Who is it do you think that has given you the opportunity to display all of those gifts and abilities that others rate so highly? From your salvation to how you feel about being you, it is all, all about grace. You and I, we're going to have to live in a world where everything we do is critiqued or judged or rated or graded. That is just the way it is in this world. Don't let that rating define you, though. Let Jesus define you. 
Let Jesus define how you feel about being you. The Haggis Emporium? I'm not so sure that the world is ready for that idea yet. But the world is ready for this idea. That new covenant. That covenant of grace. Let God define how you feel about being you. Shall we pray? Dear Father in heaven, it is a difficult thing to live in a world where everything we do from a very young age through our grade, school, high school, college, lives of work, even into retirement, where everything we do is somehow judged or critiqued. That's the world's way. You have shown us today in the new covenant a different way. You have given us the antidote for the times that we feel like we are not much. You have given us the antidote for those times that we have overvalued ourselves. Lord, at the end of the day, when we put our heads on our pillows, may it be with a calm assurance and confidence we know who we are. We are your children. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please rise. Now may the